Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Muslim Do Success Stories. And in particular, with success stories, we want to highlight and spotlight Muslim figures in the community who are doing amazing, amazing work. And mashallah, with me here today is none other than Sister Nargis from My Voice magazine. Mashallah, she's done a ton of work in the community. How's it going, Sister Nargis? Assalamu alaikum. Everything is well. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, it's going to be fun, mashallah. And when it comes to the youth, you know, planning ahead, and especially with a magazine, you know, that's something that you hear time and time again with investing in the youth, youth are our future, creativity outlets. I guess to start off this conversation, in a nutshell, for those who aren't aware of what My Voice is all about, it's always a great idea to hear the founder story, the origin story. How did you come up with this? And, and we'll unpack the conversation from there. Well, actually, I was I asked to MC a, a thinking retreat of all the imams in the GTA in 2011. And as I was emceeing, I actually heard them talk about a survey that was done in North America where 95% of Muslim youth were saying that they feel detached from their religion, from their faith. And that was a shock to me because my children were younger at that time. They were not teenagers as yet, but I it was something I never even thought about. So from there led this whole discovery of let's figure out what these kids want. Why are they feeling so detached? What's the identity crisis about? And 2013, after doing the survey and talking to teenagers, we decided, okay, let's launch this uh, magazine where you will design, you will write whatever you want, you will edit, you will run the entire show, you will run the entire organization. And at the time, of course, I didn't realize it, but alhamdulillah, what it also did is uh, one number one, it built their confidence, built their uh, skills in running an organization. But at the same time, when people picked up a magazine that looked all creative and artsy by these youth, they uh, learned about Muslims in a very beautiful and artistic way. It was fighting Islamophobia even before we realized it was fighting Islamophobia. So basically eight years ago, eight and a half years ago, that's how the story started. Amazing, Masha. So just, from, just to pause for a second, it wasn't like you were planning on this and this was your dream from day one. Like, you know, some folks like Masha, we had other guests like uh, Muhammad Salah from Masrawi and even like, you know, the restaurant wasn't something that was in the in the works. Like it just it was happenstance and it was a consequence of something else. So Masha, you started with emceeing. You figured out there was a need. What, what were some of the things that you've noticed? You mentioned like identity. Could you expand a bit about that when it comes to identity and what the Muslim youth were particularly facing that prompted you to start saying, let's, let's look at some other avenues and creative outlets like magazines? Well, the thing is that um, I've always believed in a very hands-on approach uh, where you give autonomy and you let children and youth not, you don't dictate to them, but you actually let them explore and guide them. So in terms of my voice, when I was talking to these teenagers, a lot of them were talking about how they felt that what is their identity? Are we Muslim? Are we Canadian? Are we from back home? Our parents keep on saying, well, back home, this is how we did things, but now we're in Canada. So it was all muddled up. So I felt that if they let out and unleash their creativity in whatever way they don't just write they also do creativity in illustrations or video creation so they would feel comfortable and teenage years are a very sensitive age if you just give them that space they will bloom it's like a caterpillar i always tell parents if the caterpillar is in a cocoon and it's fighting to become that butterfly you don't mess with it you let it struggle and you give it the right environment so that it becomes a butterfly and it, you know, I have seen so many of these uh, caterpillars turn into bat butterflies in the past eight years, alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, look at that. What a nice, look at that. Uh, that's, that's, look, look at that, like with the caterpillar and the butterfly. And Okay, so let's, let's see. Can you give an example just for folks to get a real tangible taste of, I mean, I'm sure there are countless, if off the top of your head, is there anyone, any particular, you can keep them anonymous, if anything, but has there been a situation where you looked at a particular youth where it was like, wow, a complete 180, or what a success story, or just amazing transformation all in all, just simply because they participated in something like this? 
I have. Um, so there's a few people who have written to me and come to me after just participating a few years into the magazine and into the organization. And they said that when we walked in to us, it was just something to do a volunteer experience, getting our hours for high school. And then after that, we realized that the struggles we're having at home with our parents, with our teachers, with just our religion. I'm questioning so many things. We found the answer. It made us stronger. Uh, at the same time, there was a lot of people who got scholarships because they were able to write on the resume the skills that they gained as, you know, the our outreach coordinator. So, I mean, the skills that these kids are getting literally at high school level here are what they would get after they graduate and they walk around trying to get a job. And at that job, they would be saying, um, what's your previous experience? There's two kids who actually came to me and said, we applied for medical school and we all know how hard that is in Canada. They got in to two or three of them and each time it, the interviewer was asking them, what did you do at My Voice? Another girl who got into law school and she said, the whole conversation with my interviewer for this application was about My Voice and what I did. So I hear these, um, every time it's a lot of work being the only adult and I often think how can I offload this to somebody else because I didn't realize it would be so much work then I hear these testimonials and I say okay you know what let me just continue and find a way out so alhamdulillah mashallah there you, okay so you know there's that link there you get these skills these soft skills and even some tangible skills like writing and expressing your creativity exercising those muscles letting them bloom uh, have you seen anything like this? I mean, when it comes to youth magazines, you know how, for instance, again, using the restaurants as an example, you look to your left, you look to your right, you know, they pop up here and there. Have you seen anything like this that you took as an example or, or not? And if not, why isn't there more of these kind of initiatives being put forth? So just last week, I had a meeting with some of the young professionals that I recruited this year to advise and mentor the different teams of youth. And I said to them, you know, this is so much work, raising funds for it, all the work that we do is if there's other opportunities out there in the market, maybe we should just merge with them rather than, you know, duplicating the effort. And they said, please don't do that. There's nothing out there. We really love this uh, initiative. So yes, we have looked around because honestly speaking, as I said to you, it was not a planned effort. It was not something, if I had actually known how much work it would be, I think I would not have started it just because <laughs> it's a lot of work. But uh, it's not like that. And the reason I feel is because parents and adults want to tell the youth what to do. They do not understand that you can't preach at that age. You just need to let them be creative and give them a very safe environment. And if you do that, there's actually a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that up until the age of seven, you play with your child. The next seven years, you teach them but the seven years after you become their friend. And that's something we forget. When they become teenagers and they're struggling in their little cocoon, we actually want to fix them. And we want to say, what's wrong with my kid? Why is he being moody or she's doing this? We don't understand that they need that seven years for you to be their friend. And friends don't get strict and tell you what to do. They listen to you and they try to understand you. Interesting. So giving that, all right, no, you mentioned about that space. Can you elaborate a bit more? What kind of environment, or you can say, quote unquote, work culture, you can, although it's nonprofit, it's volunteer based. What is the type of environment that you've created, mashallah, along with the help of, you know, teammates that allow the youth to blossom and bloom and grow? So the magazine team, which consists of editor in chief and head editors, designers, illustrators, and section editors, they're all young um, high school or university students, right? So they have to have a quarterly meeting to discuss the theme, they invite and open it to other youth. So that's the product that they create the way they do it. But then underneath that, just like in any organization, you need to have departments, the finance department, the administration department, the marketing department. One, one youth said, I want to start making building the app for it. So getting them the right softwares, getting them the right trainings, finding people who can either teach them or letting them learn themselves. Whenever they say, I want to do something, I don't shut them down. I have a discussion. I say, okay, look at the pros and cons. Do what you have to. One girl wanted to do a TV show. She did a 13 episode TV show in a studio. It's called the My Voice Show and you can find it on our YouTube channel. Uh, I said, go ahead. You know, I'll help you, but it's your idea. You go with it. So I think it's 
just the fact that they feel I have an idea, I can go with it and I'll get some help when I need it. And no one's gonna tell me not to do it. The only place I do keep an eye out is, is if when they do something that could get them in trouble, either through not doing it Islamically correctly, or if they might say something that could get them politically in trouble. So I keep an eye out for that. But other than that, they're free to do whatever they want. Interesting. So there are. So Hamza, so it sounds like ownership is the big key here. When you really own the project that you put your, your, your mind to and you just go press forth with that, you really cultivate that sense of, all right, let's make it happen. Let's see, here are the tools, here are the resources. You want to make a TV show? All right, great. Let's put the resources together. Is that, is that accurate? Like you're really cultivating that whole, let's see how we can make this become a reality as opposed to just shutting them down from the get-go and say, yep, this isn't going to work. Don't do it. We don't have the money. We don't have the funds. We don't have this. We don't have that. Like as so many others, is that a fair way of saying how it describes the overall environment? It is for sure. And, and funds has always been a big deal. It has been something that we have to do throughout the year, raise funds. We do launch good campaigns in Ramadan and everything. I feel it's, it's a very expensive project, but at the same time, it's a miracle that somehow we break even. Somehow, alhamdulillah, we're even able to, able to send Eid the gift cards to all these volunteers, you know? So it turns out, well, the first five years, I should mention some one of the projects that I want to bring back is a, a stage plays. So we had a girl who loves writing scripts for stage plays. And so we got these kids together. They acted. Uh, one of the plays actually is Muslim Fest found out about it. They said, could you repeat it at Muslim Fest? And we did that as well. It, they were phenomenal. They were amazing. And I'd like that project to actually start again. Wow, there you go. So there's there's one thing in the pipeline, but let's pull back the curtain a little bit. You mentioned and you hinted at at the fact that if you knew now, if you knew then what you know now, you probably wouldn't have started given the mountainous task of putting something like this together as an initiative. What are some of the challenges, if you can be candid in sharing about what it takes to actually run this youth organization, especially for my voice, because, you know, things don't just happen out of thin air. There's work, there's effort, there's things to be put in place. Can you share some insights as to what is it like in the kitchen, so to speak? For sure. Um, basically, number one, as I mentioned, raising the funds, being an adult uh, in the organization, it's pretty much my job to do that. Um, secondly, there's always things like I'm a little bit of a perfectionist when it comes to doing anything from the banner of Islam or Muslims. So I have to make sure that these kids, whatever they put out there has to look really good. You know, you have to read or watch whatever it is has to be done really well, as well as it could be. Then of course there's team meetings, getting them to do things outside of their homework and projects. Teenagers get distracted a lot. And I think um, having 30, 40, 50 under you and chasing after them, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it keeps you up at night. And <laughs> sure things get done on time. And of course, you know, if you say first of December, the next issue is going to be out, then things have to fall in place with time. So just teaching them time management. It's always constantly mentoring and teaching. And it's not one or two youth. So, you know, at home, you have three or four teenagers maximum at one go. But uh, here it's uh, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so, so yeah it does and then on top of that i have a family and i have a job too so this being volunteer work it turns out to be a mountainous type of a pile on my head and shoulders <laughs> but marshall i mean i mean to ref, i guess to reinvigorate as a you know the mission of why you're doing this in the first place you seeing those letters of appreciation you're not doing it for the appreciation or letter but just seeing the fruits of your labor marshall i'm sure it invigorates you no it does. Uh, every single time I think that's what uh, God does, that every time I think, oh, my God, this is too much. I should probably shut it. My mental health is important. I get one of these testimonials. Sometimes I get them from non-Muslims who have just picked it up at the library and have said, we had no idea that Muslim youth were writing such amazing things. And we felt such a connection. And I said, I say to myself, you know, what's the purpose of my life if I'm not giving back to community? And it's not supposed to be easy to do that, right? It is supposed to be a little bit of hard work. So alhamdulillah, for as long as I have the energy and mental capacity, I will continue. Uh, but I would like to have other adults who are like-minded to come and support it. And I'm trying to build that team now. Okay, so maybe let's, before we move on to other areas of discussion, maybe maybe now is a good time to share what, what are some resources that you feel like would be great, like for those listening and for those in the community and beyond, 
because now the world is ever so connected. Maybe you, you never know who can help. What are some things you mentioned that you want to build a team? If you could list off, I guess, off the top, what would be some things that would really take my voice to the next level and what's needed to get there? Uh, we do need some, I would love to have a business consultant who can come and sit and understand the project and see how we can make it sustainable rather than always uh, looking for funds, just raising funds and asking for donations gets to be a lot. And if there's some way that we can do it uh, better to make it a long term sustainable project, that would be great. I uh, would love to have other professionals who feel that, you know, I can be an advisor to the app team, I could be an advisor to the marketing team, um, and, and just be there, maybe even help us raise those funds or find sponsors. That would be excellent. I just need adults, but these adults, when they come and they see the work, they actually just drop the ball and run away. I want people who realize it's going to be work. Working with teenagers and youth is challenging. You do have to run after them and you should be willing to run after them. And if you're okay with that and you have the patience, then yes, I would love to have that help. Okay, Masha. So there's a call out for those folks. If, if, if your name is written on that, then it sounds like something to consider and reach out for sure. And so now, I guess shifting gears for another moment when it comes to the youth particularly, especially given the fact that a lot of this, well, this is actually 100% revolving around youth. Are there any top misconceptions that you've noticed when it comes to our Muslim youth? Maybe some things that are tossed around. You know, for one thing you mentioned about, not necessarily a misconception, but at one point you, uh, you, know, you remarked about how parents, sometimes we talk at our teens as opposed to letting them develop and grow and giving them that space what are some other maybe misconceptions is one thing or what are some other areas of observations that you notice that you know on the one side it looks like this but actually based on experience it's this yes so one of the reasons that i did start this magazine it was because one of those i was hearing those misconceptions and some of them were not misconceptions because um, a lot of our teenagers were calling our school boards and, and complaining about their parents. So when you hear that, you go in shock and think, what is the world coming to? What is happening to our teenagers? Uh, what are we doing wrong? All of that, right? And we blame the culture. We blame, oh, we should have not come to Canada or something like that. But the reality is that if you treat somebody with love and kindness and give them space and hear them out and understand that their generation and your generation are different, the times you lived in and the times they're living in, are different and you as parents do need to understand and adults do need to understand what part of your deen is you know applicable in haram and halal black and white but not everything is that we use we use these words really loosely and that's what keeps our children away from us drags them down we get angry at them rather than trying to understand them i feel dealing with these youth they're very creative they just want to be respected. They want to be heard. They're really good kids, really, really good kids. I love all of them. And I think about each one of them and I really feel this affection as if they were my own children. Um, that is just something you don't feel if they were really that bad. <laughs> you know, you wanna wipe your hands off of them but that doesn't happen with me. Uh, one in a, once in a while, you might find a difficult child but I'm also a life coach and I get parents bringing their kids to me and I realize it's the parents who need the coaching first before the kid does. Real okay. All right, let's continue that train of thought because let's just say, for instance, that you have a, you know, we're not painting everyone with the same brush, and we don't want to paint a bleak picture. Um, however, it would be naive of us to say that all Muslim parents, all Muslim kids, are on the right track and everything is all going smoothly. No, there are some troubles that happen. So, what would you say? Okay, let's let's continue that train of thought about the parents who need life coaching. And let's just say you have a, a, a teen who's on the rocks, the folk who's on the edge, that's maybe not making the greatest of choices and life decisions. And what could my voice do? I mean, have you seen anything like that, like as a transformation? Um, yeah, feel free to carry on uh, with that. So there was there was a girl who joined our team at the point at that point I think she had just done her high school and she had uh, joined. I don't want to say the name of the institute, but it's a only uh, only religion institute where you do one or two years of course in in your faith, learning the aqidah and all that. And so she was from a very religious family, her abaya, everything was there. 
And on the surface, you would think, okay, good family, religion, everything. But she came to me in her writing, her articles were very rebellious and they were against her mom and her dad. And I had to actually correct them. I had to say, you can say these things, just be polite. These are still your parents. So after a year, a year and a half, she came back to me and she said, you have no idea how much this calmed me down, this experience, and how much it made me understand how to deal with the problems I'm having at home. So as long as I'm able to reach that student nowadays, year and a half in COVID, sometimes you don't understand on Zoom what's actually happening. So that connection has not been as strong. But when we used to do in-person meetings and events, um, I could see just, I could just sense looking at the, the person that there's some, some problem happening. I need to have a chat with them. Um, and I did that. But if the parents come to me and if they bring their kids, I always say to them, start with apologizing to your child. Your child is not acting in a vacuum. Something happened the way you treated them. Start, sit down, acknowledge that, yes, the way I treated you was wrong. And I'm so sorry. I'm a human being. And then we take it from there. Interesting. Claire, so, I mean... Yeah, I don't know what to say about the folks who are on the outside, everything seems to be nice and shiny and well, but then deep down inside, there's some things behind closed doors, skeletons in the closet, so to speak. Now, you mentioned that when you, you can look at, sir, I guess, Masha, now with your years of experience and dealing with youth, there are probably some patterns. Are there any telltale signs that when you, when you have a youth, brand new youth, uh, a young man or a young woman, and they just come to you, are there any things that you particularly look out for and are warning signs, red flags, where you're like, okay, this could be someone who has some inner demons that they need to face or have some situations that they're repressing and things of that nature. Is there anything like that that you can point to as you know, telltale signs that this particular teen is in this situation? Yes, there's a couple of different signs. Either the child will be so quiet and so timid and trying to hide so that nobody picks on them that you could see that that confidence and that love was not given at home or something happened in school because naturally you should see by the time the children are uh, teenagers, there should be some form of confidence, just sitting there with your back straight or something like that, right? But if you're trying to hide behind people, not understanding, not making eye contact, there's that. Then there's the other child who comes in and they are being cocky about adults, about clothes, trying to make fun, do little tidbits of rebellious remarks about the dean or about their adults. And you could tell that they're hating on somebody in their mind because that somebody has hurt them. And because of that, they're associating the rest of their culture or their religion with that. So, you know, the body language, some of the words they say makes, you could tell. So can you give an example of, let's say, about the, the remarks that you that, that someone might be saying that, that are poking, poking fun at the dean or at a particular adult? Is there any, well, again, keeping people anonymous, just so that we can get a real, so you mentioned body language and, you know, the timidness. Is there any verbalized, is there any patterns of words that are being tossed around that you've seen that, you know, that perks your ears up? Uh, there's nothing specific. I think, um, first of all, it happened a couple of years ago and uh, ever since then. But that girl uh, that I remember, she left after a while. She did not want to stay because obviously if you have 15, 20 kids in the room, no matter what I say, she's not getting that one on one time, nor is she wanting it. She needs help um, or he needs help. So when she did come and she was being very loud or she was mocking what is modesty anyway what is this whole deal with hijab and you don't really need to wear one to be a good muslim and i said yeah that's true you're right but we don't really need to fight about it like we don't need to argue about it we could just accept it you could be the best muslim ever without wearing your hijab and that's fine but do we need to bring it up and make a big fuss about it right now and just that alone helped me realize that there was some force in the house uh, maybe somebody and I uh, recently have had a couple of kids come to me and they tell me that their parents make very 
uh, racist remarks against other cultures, and this is Muslims. And so they, they're growing up in an environment where that's not tolerated. Islam doesn't tolerate it, but then the parents are using Islam as an, as an example. So there's a lot of mixed messages. And if we're not honest with our children, if we're not pure with our children, our children are not gonna respect us. And hence, right. because of that by association, they will not respect the culture we're from. I see, I see. Now, speaking of the Muslim community in general, Masha, it sounds like, you know, my voice is, correct me if I'm wrong, more along the lines in the category of like the arts, no? Like it's something along the arts and you mentioned um, script writing and plays. How has the Muslim community responded to that? Because maybe, just maybe the overarching theme is like you have the big three mashallah doctor engineer lawyer and if you're not part of that big three god help you you know so how has the muslim community responded or do they appreciate this do they value this is it something that's marginalized is it something that's at the forefront how has the muslim community in your experience responded to my voice and its endeavors and initiatives because the product is a magazine and they don't see what happens in the back end, people think it's just the arts. It is a lot of it arts, but in the back end, the, the boys and girls are um, developing a lot of skills, entrepreneurial skills, app development is all technology, uh, video editing, creation, graphic design, all of that is tech. So they are developing that and people don't realize that. The other thing is that in the beginning when we did start, they were apprehensive and they did say that what is this deal with pictures why do you need to have a photograph why do you need to have why can't you just have hand-drawn flowers or something so I did get a, a few of those but uh, if you know me Muhammad I don't really pay attention much to the community I do, what I have to do. <laughs> um so uh, it's been going really well. And I and I, every year I say, wow, alhamdulillah, it's been a miracle this year too that we went through and we published. We used to distribute 20,000 magazines for free around the GTA in libraries and mosques at events and cafes uh, at schools, right? And 20,000 uh, magazines, 24 page glossy, beautiful magazines cost a lot. <laughs> uh, and just, uh, yeah, it's not, it's, it's, it is a miracle, honestly. And I think with the arts, um, a lot of the parents have come to realize that what you put on your resume has to be diverse. You may be wanting to go into med school, it doesn't matter, but your med school uh, teacher or interviewer is going to want to see how diverse, how many different types of experiences have you had? Have you worked at a Tim Hortons? Have you, you know, done like some, something creative? Have you raised funds for a cause? Just, we are actually right now run, running a, a winter drive for the neighborhood organization in Thorncliffe, uh, where we're collecting either donations on our website or we are collecting things to give them. 19th of December is the last date. So these kids are not just doing it for themselves. We are trying to make them realize they need to raise funds for, their, for other projects that in the community you know, need funds. Um, so alhamdulillah, they, they speak out on justice projects as well, the Uyghurs, the Rohingyas, they, when we had the Black Lives Matter, they did a lot of interviews of Black Muslims from the United States and Canada. So I would suggest people go to our YouTube channel and like it, and at the same time, watch these videos. Mashallah, and then on that note, you know, it's been a phenomenal conversation unpacking a lot of the amazing things and initiatives that our Muslim youth are spearheading and not it's it's completely run by youth. You're mashallah, you're overseeing and making sure that, you know, no, com, you know, not overstepping unnecessary boundaries, you know, and like, you know, getting people in hot water. But aside from that, it's it's youth run. It's it's made by the youth for the youth, all for the youth, mashallah. And so with that, as uh, you know, I'd be remiss to put a little bow tie in this conversation by asking if there was one piece of golden advice that you would give to our youth and to the parents, you know, the parents of the youth who may be watching this, you know, what would that be? And how can people reach out to my voice and contact, you know, and get involved if they may, you know, whether they want to see more about the initiatives, be a part of it, participate, um, be a mentor, be a part of that team, what have you. So what's that piece of golden advice for the youth and the adults and how can people find out more about my voice? 
Uh, to parents, I would just say that encourage your children to be a part of these organ these organizations, whichever organization they want to be a part of, because they will need that those skills. It builds their confidence, but at the same time, support them. So if they need to be driven somewhere, if they need to go somewhere, don't make a big deal. They're teenagers; they can't get a, get there on their own. Uh, help them that way. Secondly, with the youth, I would say encar I would encourage you to apply. You would find your way, but be very committed and consistent. Um, thirdly, um, subscribe to our magazine. Our magazine is beautiful. When you get it, you would love reading it. It is an amazing collector's item, in my opinion. It is probably the best magazine you would have held and read in your <laughs> life. <laughs> I know I'm going on and on, but I actually love what these kids do. And uh, our December issue, if you subscribe by Sunday on our website, so you would be able to get a copy in the mail, inshallah. And please follow us on our social media. And if you're able to support our youth, there is a donation button on our website as well. Really appreciate it. What's the website link just to make, is it My Voice Canada or what's the? My voice, can, yes, myvoicecanada.com. My and, Voice Canada. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yes, myvoicecanada.com and all of our social media icons are My Voice Canada, YouTube as well as My Voice Canada. So myvoicecanada.com, you're on that website, you get access to all the social media. Do they, do, do, people, do Muslims have to be Canadian to benefit from this? Maybe someone oh. who's watching from overseas is saying, hey, oh, it's only Canadians. What is, is it? Oh, no, no, we actually have a lot of youth in, uh, in uh, New Jersey, like in the United States. And we had a few in the past from the UK as well, one or two from Malaysia. So, you know, whenever they find out, I've actually had requests from overseas from different continents asking how can we duplicate and replicate my voice. So maybe if somebody has a business mind and can help us reach those places and duplicate this effort, that would be great. There you go. There you go. So Masha, the origin story, the foundation is set in Canada, but this is worldwide for all Muslim youth. Inshallah. So my voice, oh, look at that. Myvoicecanada.com. Look at that. So thank you so much, Sister Nargis, for turning our caterpillar youth into butterflies. And may Allah sponsor put more baraka in your initiative, helping the youth grow, find themselves, and be productive members of society that ultimately would make their parents smile all day long. Thank you so for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Muhammad. You're most welcome. And tune in next week for another episode of Success Stories. This is your brother, Muhammad Maxwell Hassan here. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.